Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we introduced the idea of sampling. In this lecture, we'll dig into the mathematics of it and introduce the ideas of digital frequencies and talk about an interesting effect called aliasing. To express the concepts concretely, let's talk about sampling sinusoids. In the continuous domain, we're representing things using these parentheses with a T inside. In the discrete time realm, we use this bracket notation with N, where we compute X of N by taking our original X and evaluating it at T equals N capital TS. So capital TS is our sample period. Some sources will use a notation like X with a subscript N. Let's group the omega capital TS together and define that as omega hat. So omega hat equals omega times the sample period, or equivalently, omega divided by the sampling frequency. We call omega hat a digital frequency, although all of this theory applies to discrete time analog systems where you're not explicitly digitizing an amplitude. As f varies from 0 to the sampling frequency fs, omega hat varies from 0 to 2 pi. Notice that the per second unit of f cancels with the per second unit of the sample rate, so you wind up thinking of omega hat as having units of radians, not radians per second. Later in the course, when we look at designing DSP filters, we'll see that it's very convenient to work in this omega hat domain. Here is a 100 hertz sinusoid that we're sampling with a 1 kilohertz sample rate. I can think about making a discrete time spectrum. The previous two-sided spectra we looked at had omega here. Now we have omega hat. The labels for the lines are the same as before. We'll write a over 2. Don't forget to divide by 2 because we have a two-sided spectrum with e to the j phi, where phi is the phase down here. And on the other side, we have the complex conjugate. To compute omega hat, we divide by the sample rate. So here, omega hat is 2 pi times 0.1. That's 100 divided by 1,000. And then we, of course, have the negative frequency on the other side. So omega hat is 2 pi times 0.1. Now, of course, you can also write this as 0.2 pi but sometimes it's convenient to leave the 2 pi alone. Spoiler alert, this gets more complicated. Now, let's suppose you're sampling a constant wave that's just the number a. You could think about that as a cosine with a frequency of 0. And let's say you sample it at 100 hertz. If I think about this directly, well, I take my 0 hertz frequency divided by 100, and that gives me an omega hat of zero. So I could put a line here. And since this is DC, I just stick an A there. I don't divide by two. Now, I should warn you, something strange is about to happen. What happens if I take a 100 hertz wave and sample it at 100 hertz? Well, then I'm always going to be hitting the waveform at the same point. I have one sample per cycle. So this looks identical to what you'll get by just sampling a DC signal, a constant. The exact value you get will depend on what the particular phase here is, because that determines the particular point you wind up hitting on each cycle of the side wave. So this gets weird. If I think about brute force taking my F of 100 and dividing it by my FS of 100, that would suggest that my omega hat is 2 pi, but it really feels like I should have a line at zero. So what's going on? What you just saw was a special case of the effect of aliasing. Remember that you could always add or subtract integer multiples of 2 pi inside of cosine and get the same thing. So you could imagine writing plus 2 pi in here and then pulling out the n. And we see that omega hat is actually ambiguous with 2 pi. So for all of those spectral lines I showed you in those omega hat style spectra in the previous slides, there's an infinite number of copies of each of those 
spaced two pi apart going off in both directions. Here's an illustration of the big picture. Suppose I have a signal that's a constant and a couple of cosines with frequencies omega 1 and omega 2. If I sample this at a sample rate f of s, then I'm going to get this discrete time spectrum in the omega hat land. But in addition to all of my original lines, I'll have a copy up at 2 pi and up at 4 pi and 6 pi and a copy at minus 2 pi, minus 4 pi, etc., etc., extending infinitely in both directions. But that's okay. If I'm sampling at a rate that's greater than twice, whatever my highest frequency component is, then these copies don't overlap. And a couple lectures from now, we'll talk about how we can recover this original signal and not worry about what the aliases are doing. But if we violate this requirement, then you wind up with a situation where the various copies, those aliases, can overlap in that same sort of spectral band as the original copy, and it gets all scrambled up. This effect is called aliasing. Now, the aliases always exist. What we want to avoid is the aliasing, where we have trouble figuring out which is which. Let's do an example in equation land. Suppose we have a 200 hertz signal that has a frequency of 400 pi radians per second, and we sample it at 100 hertz. So we take that 400 pi, divide it by 100, and wind up with an omega hat of 0.4 pi. Now let's consider doing the same thing to a frequency of 1200 hertz, equivalently 2400 pi radians per second. And if we sample that at 1,000 hertz, we wind up with an omega hat of 2.4 pi. But I could write this 2.4 as 2 plus 0.4. So if I split that up, I could write this as 0.4 pi n plus 2 pi n, which I know doesn't change the cosine. So cosine 2.4 pi n is equivalent to 0.4 pi n. So I have two different frequencies going in in continuous time, but when I sample them at the sample rate, they wind up giving me the same sequence inside the computer. Now, let's think about the difference of the frequencies that went in. Notice that difference is 2 pi times 1,000. So that's 2 pi times the sample rate. Remember, the aliases in terms of omega hat are separated by 2 pi. If I map those back to the continuous time domain, they're separated by the sample rate. To think about this a little more generically, I can imagine taking this cosine and where I have my frequency f in hertz, I can imagine adding or subtracting some integer multiple of the sample rate. Well, I guess technically I could say add or subtract some natural number times the sample rate, which would be equivalent to adding and integer times the sample rate. Okay, I promise I'll try to avoid being that pedantic in the future. So to sample this signal and get it into x of n format, we replace t with n divided by the sample rate. So omega hat is 2 pi over fs times this f plus lfs. And when I separate this out, I wind up with 2 pi l fs over fs, and the fs is cancel. And this 2 pi l, well, that's just 2 pi times an integer. So that winds up being equivalent. So theoretically, there are an infinite number of continuous time sinusoids that when you sample them will give you the same sequence of numbers. So given a sequence of numbers inside the computer, you can't in general figure out which sinusoid it might have corresponded to, or for that matter, which bunch of sinusoids it might have corresponded to that all aliased on top of each other. So we're going to have to make some assumptions. To avoid aliasing, we want to sample at a rate that's greater than twice the highest frequency component in our signal. To ensure this, we may have to build an analog filter using things like operational amplifiers and resistors and capacitors to try to kill off any frequencies that are greater than half of the sample rate. Now there's a practical issue here 
and that any analog filter you can build isn't going to be perfect. So a little bit of aliasing may contaminate your system, but you try to keep it to a minimum. We define the Nyquist rate as twice the frequency of the highest frequency component in the signal. We want to sample at greater than the Nyquist rate. So the Nyquist rate is the property of a signal, not necessarily any particular DSP system. The Nyquist frequency is a property of a sampling system. It's half of the sample rate. It's the highest continuous time frequency that can be represented in the discrete time system without aliasing. Now, to talk about the Nyquist rate of a signal, it needs to have a max frequency. If it does have such a frequency, we say the signal is band limited. Some signals are not band limited. A pure mathematical triangle wave has an infinite number of components in its Fourier series, so it's technically not band limited. So, what's the Nyquist rate for this signal? The highest frequency component is 1000 pi radians per second. That corresponds to 500 hertz, and twice that is 1,000 hertz. So we want to sample at greater than 1,000 hertz to avoid aliasing. So let's revisit this idea of a discrete time spectrum. You generally want to include some aliases, plus or minus 2 pi, either direction. Obviously, you can't draw an infinite number of them, but you draw enough of them to get the idea. This includes what we call folded aliases, where frequencies on the left, the negative frequencies, have aliases that land on the right, and also frequencies on the positive side, the right-hand side, have aliases on the left-hand side. To get these frequencies omega hat, you may be taking some original frequencies f and dividing by the sample rate, and then drawing in the aliases space 2 pi apart. Here we have a cosine with the generic amplitude A and phase phi. It has a frequency of omega hat equals 0.2 pi. And we can split this up in terms of complex exponentials using the inverse Euler's formula to create a two-sided spectrum. And in addition to these frequencies, 0.2 pi and minus 0.2 pi, we'll have a bunch of the aliases. So from that 0.2 pi, I'll add 2 pi to get 4.2 and 6.2, but I'll also subtract multiples of 2 pi to get minus 1.8 and minus 3.8. For example, there's an alias at 4.2 pi, but I can't forget the negative frequencies, so I also need to take minus 0.2 pi and add a bunch of multiples of 2 pi, and minus 0.2 pi and subtract a bunch of multiples of 2 pi. So let's refine this example I showed you earlier, where we had a 100 hertz signal and we sampled it at a rate of 1000 hertz. We have these original spectral lines at 0.2 pi and minus 0.2 pi. If I want to be more thorough, I should draw in one of these aliases. Here I'll take minus 0.2 pi and add 2 pi to it to get 1.8. Because it's crossing this boundary here in the middle from left to right, we'll say that's a folded alias. Similarly, I'll take this 2 pi and subtract 2 pi from it to get something down at minus 1.8. Notice that if the alias has a complex conjugate here, it keeps that conjugate as it folds over that vertical axis. Similarly, if you don't have a star, you still don't have a star when you fold over like that. Now, there's an infinite number of these lines going off in both directions. But generally, you just draw a few to get a feel for what's going on. And in particular, it's the ones that land between minus pi and pi that are important. And in particular, in this example, notice that if we look between minus pi and pi, the only lines we see are the ones that we started with because we sampled at a rate that's greater than the Nyquist rate. Now, suppose we violate the sampling theorem. We have a continuous time waveform of 100 hertz, so we need to sample it at at least 200 samples per second. But here, we're only sampling it at 80 samples per second. If I use this omega hat formula, I have 2 pi times 100 divided by 80, which gives me an omega hat of 2.5, and I can draw its conjugate copy down here. Now I can draw in some aliases. 
I can take that 2.5 pi, subtract 2 pi, and I wind up with something at 0.5 pi. I'll get another alias if I subtract 2 pi again that lands at minus 1.5 pi. Notice that my label of the complex amplitude stays with all of these aliases, so they don't suddenly gain a star when I cross the vertical axis. Now we need to take that minus 2.5 pi line and make copies of it up here at minus 0.5 pi and 1.5 pi. And again, if I march along here, now those copies keep the star. It doesn't lose the star when it crosses the vertical axis. So that 2.5 pi, that corresponds to this sinusoid here in the solid line. But that 0.5 pi, that corresponds to this dashed line. I can take that 0.5 pi, multiply that by the sample rate of 80 hertz, which would give me 40 pi radians per second, which corresponds to a frequency of 20 hertz, which is what that dashed line would correspond to. And that's what that 100 hertz signal would get aliased down to in a practical digital to analog conversion scheme. We'll talk about that more in a future lecture.